The views expressed in this show are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, or the U.S. government. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Philosophication with Ginger and the Beard. I'm Jason, and today we bring you the first episode in a new series of ours that we're calling The Great Books. I just want to take a couple of minutes and introduce this series so you know what's going on before you hear this conversation, and also because this project is something I'm actually really excited about. So, a while back, Michael and I both listened to an episode of the Art of Manliness podcast called Why You Need to Join the Conversation About the Great Books. And this episode was all about, well, a lot of the great books from the history of Western thought, culture, and civilization. You know, what they are, why they're so great, and why we modern folks should read them and talk about them. So after hearing that podcast episode, we decided this would be perfect conversation material for our show. And we decided to join the conversation too. So we got a reading list that was originally published in the 1972 revised edition of a book by Mortimer Adler called How to Read a Book. And this list has all kinds of books on it from throughout the Western tradition, from ancient Greece all the way up through the 20th century. So what we'll be doing is going through that list in more or less chronological order, reading each book and having a conversation about it for our show. This is definitely not a short-term project. There are a couple hundred books on the list, and many of them, I'm sure, will not exactly be easy or quick reads. So we fully expect to be doing this for quite a while. But the thing about this project is that it's not really meant to be completed quickly. We really want to get something out of every book on the list and also out of the project as a whole, so we're not rushing it. So for this series, we'll be reading a really wide range of different genres. We'll be reading epic poetry, such as for this episode. We'll also be reading books of prose fiction, history, philosophy, mythology, science, mathematics, plays, much more. Now one final thing I want to add is that these episodes are not meant to be in-depth analyses or critiques of these books. If you want to hear that, there are many, many far more qualified people than us you can go to. What we're trying to do in this series is discuss big ideas and interesting things that occur to us while reading. It's basically just a normal episode of our show, but using a great book as a conversation starter. So we're really excited about this project, and we hope you, our listeners, will join us on this journey and in this conversation. Our first book on the list is Homer's Iliad, which is the oldest surviving written work in the entire Western canon. In case anyone cares, we read the Oxford University Press publication, translation by Anthony Verity, and I'll leave a link in the description to that edition on Amazon in case anyone is interested in reading the same one. We decided to split this conversation into two parts. This episode will deal with war and honor culture, and part two will deal with fate, destiny, and the gods' role in the story. So, I think that's all I have to say by way of an intro. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy this conversation on Homer's Iliad. So it's finally happening. Finally talking about the Iliad after all these months. Nice. So, first of all, I mean, before we start talking about this, I want everyone listening to know that you suck. And that it's your fault we didn't do this months ago. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's important to me that everyone knows you're a butthole. I so, think everyone knows that already. Yeah, you're right. So anyway, uh, so I thought we'd summarize real quick what happens um, in the story before we jump into it. So actually, when I was before I read this, I, I read this a while back, like in middle school or something. But before I read it, I, I'd kind of forgotten. But before I read it, I thought it was pretty much like a direct, um, like a story of the Trojan War. And I thought that Brad Pitt movie was pretty much an adaptation of the Iliad, which it's not. Um, but it turns out it's actually like a smaller story within the Trojan War. So when it starts, the Trojan War has already been going on for like nine years. And we, we are in the 10th year. And um, when it starts, the, Tro or the, uh, the Achaeans, um, or the Greeks, they use a couple of different names for them, like Achaeans, Greeks, and something else. But So the Achaeans have just sacked a Trojan city, or a, a Trojan-allied city, and carried off a bunch of spoils of war. 
and um, there were these two girls, um, Briseis and Chryseis, and um, Agamemnon got Chryseis as his spoil of war, and and uh, Achilles gets Briseis. Um, then there's this whole thing, like Chryseis turns out to be the daughter of a priest of Apollo, who tries to ransom her, and Agamemnon is really rude to him, and so Apollo sends a curse uh, or a plague on the Achaean army, and in order to stop it, Agamemnon has to give the girl back to her father. Um, so then he he's like, well, Achilles can't have better spoils of war than me because I'm a, a, in a position of higher power than he is. So he takes Briseis for himself, and Achilles is pissed, and that's kind of the inciting incident for the whole thing. So Achilles gets pissed and refuses to fight until Agamemnon <clears throat> makes it up to him somehow, like either gives him back the girl or, uh, you know, honors him and apologizes. So uh, Achilles goes to his mother, which is uh, a, her name's Thetis. She's a, she's a sea goddess, like a, can't remember if it's like a nymph or some kind of immortal. And um, Zeus owes her a favor, so she goes to Zeus and asks him to make the Achaeans lose the battle until Achilles comes to fight for him again. So that's kind of, that kind of kicks off the whole thing. And then, you know, there's a bunch of battles, like the battle rages back and forth for a few days. And the Achaeans are losing, things get really desperate for them. Eventually, they get desperate enough to go go back to Achilles and beg him to come back into the fight because they know if he comes back into the fight, they're going to be a lot better off and they're going to be winning again. So he refuses, um, but his best friend Patroclus uh, asks him to go fight instead. Like he wants to take Achilles unit, the Myrmidons, who are like an elite unit, and um, lead them into battle wearing Achilles' armor. So maybe, you know, the Trojans will think he's Achilles and be afraid. So he goes and does that and gets killed. Um, and then Achilles gets pissed again that Patroclus died, forgets about his beef with Agamemnon, and... Uh, goes back into the fight. Um, he's really pissed at Hector, who's the, the main hero on the Trojan side. He has a duel with Hector, kills him, and uh, takes his body and like defiles the body or whatever because his rage is still you know, burning strong. And he doesn't let go of it until Hector's father, King Priam of Troy, comes and visits Achilles and begs for his his son's body back and that's the point where achilles lets go of his anger and gives the body back and priam takes T priam takes hector's body back to troy and uh they conduct a funeral for him and that's where it ends so it's really the story is about achilles and his rage like he there's this incident that makes him angry right at the start. And when Patroclus dies, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't let go of his anger. He just, his, he just redirects his anger from Agamemnon to Hector and continues being angry. And then he finally lets go of it at the end. So that's what the story is really about. Um, but let's, let's go ahead and talk about the, the incident that kicks it all off because this seems super petty at first glance. Like Agamemnon takes this girl and um, Achilles is pissed about it. And he goes to his immortal mother and asks her to talk to Zeus to make his own army lose, you know, until he rejoins the fight. So it's like, there's a beef over a girl <laughs> and he prays to Zeus essentially for the deaths of all his, his comrades. And it's like, what the hell's going on there? 
but there's more to it than that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's really, it's really, really prideful, right? The fact that he would wish for his own army to, to keep losing until, until he gets back there. And it really, I think it, this book demonstrates a lot of things about how culture used to be uh, warrior culture, honor culture, but like, it also really demonstrates in this like heroic age, like when someone wanted to be a hero, that it really was just all about them. You know what I mean? Like the idea of all of his countrymen dying wasn't, you know, it was more important that he won glory. You know what I mean? That he, you know, that his pride and his and glory were satisfied and, uh, nowadays in the military it seems like it's still important pride and glory but you know the idea of trading other people's lives for it is uh not really a, a prevalent thing and it seems from all the stories granted they are all you know epics and basically hollywoodized uh in their own version of hollywoodized but uh it seems like the focus was a lot more on personal glory you know what i mean yeah it definitely was um but the the thing about this culture like this is the epitome of an honor culture um mm -hmm. obviously but so the thing about this culture like they're not they're living in a world without any rigid structures of government right like there there's not there's not like a state to keep order. It's just, it's basically just a bunch of warlords competing for power. So it, it's like anyone who occupies a position of power, like Achilles or Agamemnon has earned it through being better than everyone else. Yeah. And, and they're in that position because they were strong, because they were, uh, because they were smart and brave and all of those things that a warrior is. And everyone wants that position. Like there's, or there's lots of people that want that position. Like it's competitive and it's competitive to get and it's competitive to keep. So it's very important to everyone who is in a position like that, that to maintain it because sometimes, I mean, either they could lose that position, which they don't want or, losing that position could mean death lots of the time. So it's important to maintain that position. And the way they do it is by demonstrating their honor to everyone around them. And honor is a very public thing. It's not like something that you can just be secure with for yourself. Like if, if everyone, if everyone around you is going to respect and honor you, you have to demonstrate your honor to them outwardly. And the way they do that is through possessions and women. So, that's really what Briseis is. She's not just a girl. She's a status symbol for Achilles and Agamemnon. And um, so when, it, when Agamemnon takes her away, that diminishes Achilles' reputation and his honor. And he, uh, he can't just let that go. He, just, he can't just let that stand and still fight for Agamemnon. So... That's what it's really about. It's not just a guy getting <clears throat> upset that a, that he can't bang a girl. Like maybe that was part of it, but um, it's more about her as a status symbol, and uh, it's it's really a life or death, or th things like that can be a life or death thing. So there's more to it than just Achilles being petty. Like he is kind of petty. Even in the story, like the way he's characterized is that he is being kind of petty for this, but uh, not as much as we would think, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's clearly petty, but it's like, it almost makes sense in the context in, in that day and age and in his position, you know, that, yeah. you know, if the most important thing to you is basically your reputation you know you can call that honor you can call it legacy you know then 
you just can't let something like that slide and just forgive and forget. You know what I mean? Yeah. So makes perfect sense in from his shoes. Yeah, that's I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Like it, in the context of that culture, it makes perfect sense, even though it's not great. <clears throat> um, but that's what like that's one thing that I've been thinking about since reading this because I think you and I probably have a tendency to to look on the more positive aspects of honor culture. Yeah. And think that maybe we could use a little more of it today. Um, sure. But I think we tend to gloss over the downsides of which there are many. Like yeah. this is one, like a culture that a culture that encourages or uh, leads to this. Like this is a culture that facilitates stuff like this. Like thousands of people are going to die because because of Achilles' honor. And yeah. so that's a definite downside to honor culture. I think we tend to gloss over that, or we have in the past when we've talked about honor culture, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But that's, definitely. but that's a definite downside. And you could probably, you could even make yeah. the argument like, I'm sure we'll get into this later, but um, that this whole war is all about honor. Like this war yeah. would not exist if it wasn't for honor culture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if there's one downside, it's like the complete, um, it's complete lack of the ability to forgive, you know, that like basically slights require vengeance, you know, they require retribution. Uh, you can't just forgive and forget, you know, and you know, obviously, even today, there's even in our culture, there's plenty of stuff that we many people consider unforgivable and and whatnot. And vengeance is still a very like present thought whenever people are wronged. But you know, it's almost natural. You know, it's almost in in our lizard part of our brain. You know that you know to like lash out and get vengeance or whatever. But uh, but yeah. I could see a culture where that just isn't a thing at all, where you have to, you know, get revenge for every slight committed against you. Then, yeah, that could be a, a, a downside and can lead to wars, you know, huge wars where thousands of people die. Yeah. And that's another part of the story. Like, I kind of think that this story itself is the beginning of a turn away from that. Mm. Um. I don't remember who wrote this article, but it, there was some article I read about honor culture versus dignity culture and how the fusion of those led to victimhood culture. Mm. I think you probably read that article too at some point, but um, the point is like it, honor culture is what we're describing here. Dignity culture is kind of the next evolution where your reputation still matters, but the way you, the way you advance your reputation is by, not reacting to insults. Mm. So if someone insults you, you're like, uh, you know, water off a duck's back. Like, I don't care. I'm above that. Um, and I kind of think that this story, even though it definitely takes place in a, in about as pure of an honor culture as you can get, I think it's kind of the first turn away from that because the story is about Achilles rage and basically his, his retribu his retribution towards Agamemnon for that slight. And nothing Achilles does relieves him. Like he sits out of the fight, which is what he's supposed to do if he wants to <clears throat> keep his honor intact. But he sits out he sits out of the fight and that doesn't like he gets everything that he wants, basically. Um, Agamemnon ends up apologizing to him and giving everything back before he comes back to the fight. So he gets what he wants there. Um, he kills Hector, which is also what he wants. He wants, you know, he wants to avenge the death of Patroclus. Um, so he gets everything that he wants that he's trying to get because of honor culture, but he's still angry. Yeah. None of it brings him any relief. 
And the only thing that brings him relief is at the end when he has this very intimate heart to heart with Hector's father, the, the father of the enemy that he just killed um, and lets go of his anger. Like that's what he had to do to get relief. He had to not, not go to all those lengths to avenge the wrongs that were done to him. Like, it's like this all led to the deaths of thousands of people. And it's almost like the story is trying to say, maybe that's not such a good thing. And maybe it's better to let go of your anger. So you think maybe it's the Iliad is a cautionary tale from Homer about. Yeah, kind how, of how wrong. It can go if, if you're that petty or if you're that unwilling to forgive or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's something that's part of what it is, I think. Yeah. I think that's kind of the message. Yeah. Hmm. Part of the message anyway. Yeah, I guess it's funny. I always think of the Iliad as demonstrating like <clears throat> how just how awesome Achilles was, but I mean obviously there's more to it, but that but really it could be more of a critique of Achilles, you know, like it's really saying, look how horrible things can be if you care this much about your reputation or if, you know, or how little relief you can get by getting everything you want if you don't, you know, if you don't have the ability to let things go. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, it, you know, Achilles is the, is at the pinnacle of honor culture, like honor culture, as it's laid out in the Iliad, Achilles is at the pinnacle of it. Like he is, has the most honor of anyone ever, basically. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, Agamemnon is in a higher position than him, but the way they characterize him, Achilles is, is the better man. Like, yeah. Agamemnon's the better man in the, in terms of position. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Achilles is like the more honorable man. Right. Um, maybe of all time. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Even still. Yeah. Um, but the point is Achilles is the pinnacle of, of honor culture. <clears throat> and this is, at least it seems to me that the story is trying to tell us that maybe this isn't the way to be. And even though this guy, this guy is the epitome of everything you're supposed to do in honor culture and look at all the death and misery it led to for him. So maybe this needs to be tempered with something like hmm. with some kind of a, with some forgiveness or some letting things go yeah. and not having to respond to everything to that, to that extreme degree. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I thought a lot about themes of this story, but when I, I haven't thought about is the overall, message you know and that that's a that's a good point yeah that it's a negative like look at the life of achilles yeah, yeah. let's well, let's talk about the war a little bit because that kind of ties in with this so i mean i said before that i think the whole war would not exist without honor culture but you know i mean that's another part of honor culture like this war exists because of honor culture. And I think the honor culture requires war. Like the way men prove their honor in this society is fighting, like prowess in battle. Like that's, that's probably the biggest way that they demonstrate their, their honor and their manliness. Like they have to be a great warrior. And if they're not, then they, you know, then they're, they're not as honorable as the great warriors. So, how do you have great warriors if you don't have wars? And yeah. I think, I think, um, I think it's almost like the, the proximal cause of any war, or at least the proximal cause of this war in particular was, um, is just a pretense almost. It's like, we're going to go to war with somebody somewhere, no matter what. But the reason in this case was, you know, Paris stole, Helen from, from her husband and yeah. they had to go to war with Troy over it. But if it wasn't that, it would have just been somebody else, you know, going to war with somebody else for a different reason. Like there would have been a war no matter yeah. what. 
Yeah. Um, it's just, we need to find a pretense to go to war so we can go to war and, you know, men can win honor that way. Yeah. You know, um, it's something I've kind of thought a little bit about, but it's kind of hitting me just how, how similar that war and, uh, and even more recent wars are in that I think, you know, we talk about the just war theory um, in school, right at the Academy. Um, and what is it? Use ad bellum use. Yeah. Use ad bellum use in bellow. Yeah. Use ad bellum is a just cause, a just cause for war. Like you go to war for a good reason. And then use in bellow is just, behavior during war. Like you conduct war in a just way. That's use in bellow. Use ad bellum is a good reason to go to war. So um, I think people don't know it and they don't think about it, but I think to people, even today, I think that we generally think of like, think of all the best reasons to go to war. Think of the wars that people have generally supported and the ones that they haven't. You know, we haven't, as a people, the American people were very unsupportive of, you know, Vietnam and Korea and um, Iraq, right? They were more supportive in Afghanistan than Iraq, generally speaking, right? No. Um, the conduct, the use in Bellow, there's a lot of questions there, right? Like how to win the war. Not Part of use in Bellow is not just behaving honorably as soldiers and sailors and Marines and stuff, but actually having a, like your strategy, your tactics, you know, you have to try and get it over with, you know what I mean? You can, so like you could call it a violation of use in bellow by having a war that just never ends. Like you don't have a good plan. You know what I mean? That's a bad conduct during war because you're causing more suffering than is necessary. But Anyway, you think of the wars that people generally support, the use ad bellum reason for why we do it, and it, it's actually honor-based. Think about all the ones like Pearl Harbor. All right, now that is, that is pragmatically speaking, you kind of have to go to war because they are basically now at war with us, right? And if we, we can't just not fight because they're going to come attack us again. But it's also a, it's like a kick in the stones, you know what I mean? And, and it pisses us off. So we have to go get revenge. It's like, we can't just take that, right? So that example, I think even though there's multiple reasons for going to war at that point, one is honor, one is retribution, you know, justice for those that were killed, you know, but a better example is 9-11. Now, 9-11 wasn't like the opening barrage of a full-scale war, you know, it was it was terrorism. It's and by definition, all terrorism is just, it's like a single act. It's not, and they may be at war with us. So however they define that, but it isn't like an operation as part of a bigger campaign or something. Right. Yeah. It's not like we're under threat of invasion by right. the Taliban. Yeah. If we had done nothing except, you know, invent the TSA and, and do all that crap we did pass the Patriot Act and do all that horrible stuff you know, take all the precautions to prevent it again, we'd be in the same place, except we wouldn't have gone war, gone to war and gotten revenge. It's essentially our, our, our national honor was besmirched. You know what I mean? Um, and those are the reasons that Americans are, they're on board. They're like, let's do this immediately. Like it's a gut thing, you know, and we still feel that way. And I don't think people think of it like that. They don't think of honor, but I really think that's at the core of it, you know, and we do yeah, go to war for like reasons. A, it's yeah. almost like a subconscious thing. Like yeah. People don't even realize that's what they're thinking, but it's like yeah. a gut level reaction. Yeah. And if you think about all the wars that we've gone to where people, and this may not hold it true all the time, but off the top of my head, it seems that the wars that generally people have been like against on, like on the whole, you know, it's not a lot of support are the wars that don't involve an initial slight against the United States. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, the first Gulf War, you know what I mean? It, it, it wasn't an honor thing. We didn't care about Kuwait getting invaded. I mean, politicians cared, you know, strategic thinkers in the region cared, you know, people who thought, thought about world politics and Middle East politics, 
there were a lot of smart people that cared for good reasons, but it wasn't a gut thing. It wasn't like the people of, of America felt it, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, Vietnam, same thing, you know, Korea, the same thing. Uh, so, and then Iraq, like the second actually, Iraq war. Think about that. Actually, with Vietnam, wasn't that, you know, the Gulf of Tonkin incident? Yeah, yeah, I think that, that turned was... out to be a false flag. Yep, yep. Um, but it's like, what's they, the reason for doing a false flag? To get people that was supposed to be that was supposed <laughs> to be that kick in the nuts. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's like some smart people who, I don't know, whatever. I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories, whether it was deliberate or not. But <laughs> yeah, Pe seems like smart people know that about the American people or any people really that, you know, if you want them to react the way you want them to, you got to, there's got to be something like that. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's kind of a funny thing to think about. Even though we're we don't have an honor culture, we kind of do. You know what I mean? It, there's still remnants of it that remain, and yeah. that's that's definitely one of them. It's, uh, you know, and there's obviously some people who are against any war ever, and plenty of and there's plenty of reasons to critique the Afghanistan war now and the way it's been conducted. You know, but basically everybody was on board with going. You know what I mean? And we can still look back and think. Okay, we started this for a good reason, you know, but you can't, it's harder to say that about Iraq, you know, it's harder to say that about, you know, Syria, you know, uh, about uh, Yemen now, you know, all this stuff that's going on, like people didn't even know we were at war there, or that we were conducting combat operations, and it's like, what the heck, what even happened, why, you know, it's like, you need that initial slight for it to be justified in like the guts of the people. So that's just kind of an interesting thing that I just thought of whenever you were talking about how, you know, back then all war, that war was basically for honor. And it's like, well, I guess a lot of wars are at the root of it for honor, you know? Yeah. But they were just a lot more overt about it. <laughs> like they literally, yeah. they have to go to war to be good warriors to win honor. It's like, you know, it'd be like, it's, it's necessary. Yeah. And that's, a, you know, that's another downside to honor culture, obviously. Like, this this culture basically facilitates constant war all the time. Yeah. And just death and destruction all the time. Yeah. Um, but he, another thing I thought of while reading this was th this, there's like a a difference between the reason you went to war in the first place and the reason the war continues. Um. So at a, at a couple points in the story, or at one point in the story, it's like after the first day of fighting, um, and they call a truce to collect their dead or whatever, um, and then they go they go to their camps for the night, and you see there's like this meeting of the of the elders of Troy inside the city, and basically everybody hates Paris. They're like, dude, what the hell? Like you caused this you stole this guy's wife and you caused this war and it's your fault that our city's going to get sacked. So fuck you. Um, yeah. So they tell him you need to give her back, like give her back, give all of Menelaus's possessions back. So they'll leave and we don't all die. And uh, Paris is like, no, I don't want to. Um, he eventually agrees to give all the possessions back, but not Helen. Like he wants to keep the girl, but he'll give all of the possessions that he stole from Menelaus back. Yeah. So they send a messenger to the, to the Achaean army to tell Menelaus this. And uh, Menelaus isn't even the one that answers. Like he's the one whose stuff got stolen, but the one who answers is Diomedes. Who's, who's my favorite character by far. Like he, he's kind of the, while Achilles isn't fighting, he's like the main hero on the, on the Achaean side. And he does a lot of badass stuff, but he's the one who answers. And he's like, he basically says, no, we're not taking your stuff. Like we came here to sack this city and that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, and, and he's like, and he says, even if you gave Helen back, even if Helen was included in the deal, we still shouldn't take it. So basically the whole reason, the whole pretense for going to war in the first place, nobody cares about it anymore. Yeah. 
and and it's like we just we're we're just fighting now like this is just a war we came here to sack this city and like our purpose for being here is to sack the city and that's what we're going to do and the reason we came here in the first place is completely forgotten and you know this reminded me of of more modern wars also um yeah. like world war 1 for example that started yeah. because of a an an austrian archduke got assassinated by a serbian yeah and next thing you know like france is fighting germany and germany's fighting russia and britain's fighting germany and eventually america gets involved and there's like this <laughs> chain reaction of shit and next thing you know the entire world is in an uproar and millions of people are dead and and the incident that kicked it off was the assassination of one guy by another guy in in the balkans like this obscure little part of the world and yeah. it's like just a few months into the war nobody gives a shit about that yeah but it's like you know in this case the average soldier on either side doesn't give a shit about about menelaus or helen like nobody cares about that they're just here because you know they're they're here to win honor they're here to be warriors and to win honor in war mm -hmm. yeah yeah this is where like it's an interesting you know speaking of world war one right i mean i think uh you've heard dan carlin's hardcore history on it right yep. i think you may be the one that told me about it but amazing by the way i freaking loved it um yeah it was it was outstanding yeah i learned more in like one episode of that than i had in my entire life on world war one which is so crazy because we were there like we weren't there long america but how the hell do we not teach that better in school you know what i mean yeah. even even in if it was american history you know what i mean that still was a very consequential war for us, even though we played a small part in it because it changed the dynamic of the world. And it's like, we have been, that made us a superpower. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we were pretty powerful and pretty much left alone and left everyone else alone for the most part, unless they were in the Western hemisphere until that point. And that was when we became one of the most powerful countries in the world. And then in World War II, that's where we were like, far and like above and beyond the most powerful up there with the USSR, but you know, still. <clears throat> so it's so consequential in our history and yet we, we teach so little of it, you know, that's kind of surprising to me, but I learned a lot and yeah, that was one huge thing about it that, you know, you said, you know, you think Achilles like this, the Iliad basically was the beginning of the end of that culture or of that, uh, yeah, right, honor culture. Uh, it still lasted for a while, but, yeah, uh, you know, Dan Carlin was talking about how in World War I, they still, the French still had, like, those bright blue uniforms from the Napoleonic, like, they looked identical to a Napoleonic soldier from, like, 100 years earlier, you know what I mean? They, they, li they lined up, they lined up in ranks and went into battle that way and got mowed down by machine guns, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they rode horses like they still had this chivalrous like romantic idea of war you know and that's because it it was you know what i mean like i was obviously i've never been through that and i can't really speak to what it's like but there's a reason that for thousands and thousands of years men part of, like a part of them not all men but for a lot of men at least some part of them wanted to go to war. You know, like it was an opportunity for glory. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, it, above all else, the machine gun like ruined that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was already going away. You know, when when they started, first of all, muskets started changing things, but then especially rifled uh, weapons started change. Like really made a big change. But the machine gun was like the last nail in the coffin for the romantic age of war you know and you could see that from like france and how their previous war was like that they showed up thinking it would be similar all these young officers and gentlemen going out there thinking it would be like they were raised up to to, to think it was and 
it was just absolute carnage and just hell on earth you know what i mean um so i think war has always been that way even you know in troy right it's always been that way but it was also romantic and it's like any notion of romanticism was basically wiped off you know wiped out of people's minds in world war one you know what i mean and now there's just little tiny semblances of it and i think for the most part we we see that more in in moments of hair of like specific acts of courage and heroism than we do generally in war you know what i mean yeah uh, so there is still honor in war it's just less of a general thing and more of a specific action type of thing and i mean obviously there's honor in fighting period like uh, you know anyone who goes to war and fights whether they die immediately or last the whole time if, even if they don't do anything above and beyond the call of duty like that is honorable to go and do their duty but you know what i mean like honor the type of honor we're talking about is like not synonymous with glory but it has a lot to do with glory it's your reputation it's you know and that's why people were doing it this romantic idea um and so that's basically gone but and, and it's now it's pretty much reserved for you know individual acts of bravery so that's why we still have you know medals for for the most courageous acts and and stuff like that yeah and you're literally honoring them it's 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 honor you know yeah i just thought that was interesting with like how how the initial cause of a war just gets forgotten and i think that probably happens a lot like i'm sure you could come up with a like i'm sure you could point that out about most wars yeah like i mean what did pearl harbor really have to do with germany yeah like it yeah. it i mean granted you know japan and germany were allies but and like, i think germany declared war <laughs> yeah germany declared war on america <laughs> yeah which i guess you know i'm not saying we wouldn't have declared war otherwise but that definitely gave the politicians the you know everything they needed you know it's like that was stupid germany yeah yeah dumb germans but yeah we probably would have anyway even if they didn't declare war yeah. and i think that's because you know basically roosevelt and you know all the politicians pretty much wanted us to go and was just waiting for a good excuse um to war with germany not necessarily japan they didn't care so much but then, you know so we had to go to war with japan because of pearl harbor but it's like it also turned out to be a decent excuse to go to war with germany and jump in yeah. on the british side yeah but it's like it's like it's almost like war is just a it's almost like war has a mind of its own yeah. is like an entity in and of itself because you get you have a you have an initial reason to go to war like some guy steals another guy's wife or you get attacked or something or a guy assassinates an archduke and next thing you know war just takes over like yeah. the war just is a war and runs away and gets out of control you know what i mean yeah it's like nobody cares about the the reason you went to war anymore and it's just like a a living thing almost of its own. I don't know. That's kind of weird. That, that sounds kind of weird. But yeah, I you mean, get the point, about, right? Yeah, it always turns into something. If nothing else, it's either just an excuse to keep going or it was maybe you could blame it on use in Bello and like this, the plan was just bad and now you're stuck, you know. But often it's just like the mission changes, you know. <clears throat> um, your purpose changes. I think Afghanistan, we, we, we succeeded. Like Osama bin Laden's dead. The Taliban are no longer in charge, and we've been there for seventeen years. You know, eighteen. No, yeah, seventeen years. So, it's like now what? Now it's like, oh, we can't leave, or else everything will go to crap. So we gotta now. It's like, how? What's the answer? How do we? How do we leave without it going to crap? And so now everyone. Now it's just thinking about that and trying to figure it out indefinitely forever until someone finally either figures it out, which seems unlikely, or 
we just quit and leave. You know, either way, it, it has nothing to do anymore with 9 11. Yeah, you know? exactly. We've gotten our revenge, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, it's a good one. Or how about the mission accomplished? Like a, a few <laughs> weeks after uh, Iraq started, right? Right. And, uh, like, so then it, it's been that way for a long time. Like, just, okay, what do we do now? You know, <laughs> like, so. Yeah, I don't know. What else is like that? Uh, I guess it happens a lot, like most wars, but I guess for a lot of wars, that though, whole, it's not the case. I just, like, I just thought of the, uh, the Hatfield McCoy feud. Like yeah. you saw that. You, I think you were the one who told me about that. There was that series, like mini series on Netflix a while back. So good. about it. Yeah, it was yeah. really good, but Kevin I mean, that was a real, th that was a real thing that happened in history. Like these yeah. two families just like, Somebody slighted somebody else, and then it got out of control. And next thing you knew, they were killing each other all over the place, yeah. and like it just got totally out of control. Yeah. And nobody even remembered why they were fighting in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone suffered, and everyone lost. You know, there's no winners. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Which goes back to the the maybe the moral of the story. Like maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe a culture that maybe. A culture that causes that has some flaws and needs to be tempered with something else. Yeah. So, I mean, we spent all this time talking about remnants. Like, first of all, honor culture, mostly what was wrong with it and some of the things that are still around today from it. But um, maybe a good thing to talk about is what was right about it. And yeah what's wrong today and how we could, what we could use a little more of. Cause I mean, we've talked about that a little bit, but what a better opportunity than the Iliad, you know? <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. actually I, I had some thoughts on that. Um, yeah. you know, one big thing you can see in the Iliad or, um, or at least that I see in the Iliad is the basis of Western thought and Western philosophy, which is, focus on the individual. Yeah. Like this, this honor culture is very focused on individual achievement. Like it doesn't matter if you're, I mean, maybe it does. There's probably some honor that comes along with being in a unit that did something great. Yeah. It's but the, Myrmid the Myrmidons. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but for the most part, you gain status by doing things yourself. Like yeah. by being awesome yourself, you, you know, that's the way you gain status. And it's very individual focused as opposed to focused on some kind of collective. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a, you could almost call that one of the founding principles of Western civilization. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll see a lot more of this as we go through this project, but you know, the beginnings of it were here, like in this culture of, you know, ancient Greece, um, yeah. and that's led to so many great things for the world. Focus on the individual, like you are an individual and you stand or fall on your own merits and it's up to you to, you know, play the hand you've been dealt the best you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it does seem like for most of human history and still to, to a degree, um, but much worse once upon a time like the average person the the person if you weren't the king you know what i mean or something very high up like that high priest or whatever um your life just really didn't matter at all you know nobody remembered you um you were just complete cannon fodder whether it literally be for war you know you'd be fodder or if it was you know on a frontier or uh you know out but exploring, I mean, even think, yeah, people whose names we remember because they discovered some piece of land or something. It's like they had a whole team, maybe dozens, hundreds of people whose, whose names we don't remember. Um, but, and that still happens, right? But like for most of human history, like, which if we think of ancient, the ancient world where like history began whenever the things were written down, you know, whether it be drawn or whatever, it's, it's like 
what basically the um, Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, like you have, you know, some of these very ancient cultures and uh, the, the earliest written accounts of, 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 of humans doing things, right? Civilization. Um, for the first, you know, several thousand years, you could probably name on like four hands any human being by name. You know what I mean? It's like, because it's yeah. only the kings, you know, it's only, you know, there's just something about just being born normal that like was just, you were doomed to nothing, you know, doomed to nothingness and uh, something about Western civilization, something about, I suppose maybe it started in Greece, um, you know, led to this, it's really that if you were just awesome, you could make a name for yourself, you know, that you're meritocracy, basically, you know, um, that, and there was obviously, there's still monarchs, there's still, you know, people who get what they get because of their status they were born with, things like that. But there are, you know, there are conquerors. And uh, that was always a thing, obviously, a conqueror, even in the ancient world is, that's not, you weren't born with that, you had to earn it, right. But um, something about, you know, and, you know, and I don't think they had it perfect because like what you said, it was like the seeds of it because even then all these warlords are still like high born noble, you know, uh, you know, and they're leaders. They're not just, it wasn't just, they may not necessarily like Achilles is supposed to be the best warrior ever, but you can imagine somebody just, they're part of a very successful unit. They were given some leadership position. They're really awesome, but they also just had a few lucky breaks, you know what I mean? Or, or a certain status they were born with or something like that. So yeah, there's still the common nobody you still don't read about, you know, in the Iliad, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but still now there's dozens and dozens of people instead of just one king on each side, you know? That, yeah, and, and you could imagine one of those common nobodies in this story, like if they did something great in battle, like if they killed somebody great on the yeah. other side and like, yeah, stole Achilles, their armor. Yeah. Hector. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could see somebody attaining a position of status. Right. Exactly. By doing something great. It's yeah. It's the beginning of meritocracy. Exactly. Like if you just being awesome could get you really far, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, now you have, you know, <laughs> You have squishy uh, lefties that think meritocracy itself is some sort of tool of the patriarchy or, or racist or whatever, you name it. They <laughs> Meritocracy, the most unbiased thing in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. They call it, you know, whatever. But anyway, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I could see that. The remnants, the, the very beginnings of what we, of some of what we still hold really, really dear and that, I think, because I really think America, like the United States was, uh, is the first example of where that was enshrined in law. You know, those same principles existed in Western civilization. I think the Dark Ages was really bad for individualism, right? So it kind of went away or t took a nap for a while, but the Enlightenment was kind of all about... Um, yeah, you... You yeah. see it in the American Constitution, yeah. Um, also with English common law, yeah. Like that was kind of that probably even came before. That was you know part of. I mean that's part of what the American system was based on. But yeah. Well, I say yeah, it was he, enshrined in law in America first because we literally, like, they had a parliament, but the king wasn't like the queen is now. The king was powerful, and the parliament it didn't represent us. So you know. Uh, the rights of the individual was a thing in England. Um, they had a, they, I don't know, I guess they have a constitution, but it's not, it's not like a written thing like ours. It's like maybe written, but it's not, it's not like ours. It's not the fundamental uh, document that their government's based on. It's like they just made a bunch of laws about rights or something. Um, I know they don't have like a constitution like we do, but they, kind of do it's weird um i had this talk with uh, some brit and he was like we don't have a constitution i was like i thought you did and then he kind of explained it to me but anyway um no i mean 
the rights of man or whatever, uh, individual rights was definitely enshrined in British common law before America, but they certainly didn't abide by it very well, especially with their subjects, like in other parts of the world. So um, we based a whole system of government on, base, if you think about the fundamental thing that cuts across all of the, the whole constitution and the whole system is, is the reverence for the individual and the fact that the individual is the unit of action. And right or moral sort of philosophy, you know, <laughs> that people can't, that we don't use people as a means to an end, you know, that people are ends in and of themselves, individuals are. So, yeah, I think that's, that's uniquely, that was uniquely American when it first came about. I think the Declaration of Independence was a, it was like an indictment of, every government then in existence, every single one, you know what I mean? Almost all governments were kingdoms or emperors or, or something, you know, like that uh, when we became a country. And uh, even if they had parliament, like in England, they had that for quite some time, but, you know, and even we had legislative bodies in the colonies before, you know, the revolution. But anyway, it does seem like the seeds of that, which is still wasn't even close to far enough. You know, it was still pretty primitive, but the very the seeds of that do seem to be based in that they have Greek roots. You know, yeah, from way back then. So, yeah, and you see in the story, like even if somebody was born, like they they do place a lot of importance on birth. Like you'll see people bragging about who their father was or their grandfather or whatever. But even so, I think it seems like that does grant you some level of status, but in order to be like, you have to, you still have to do something yourself. Like you can't just ride your father's glory for your whole life. Yeah, it was like a good starting point. You know, people were paying attention to you, you know, so what you did. But, yeah, you still had to do something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, think of someone like Alexander the Great. You know, his dad was a king. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. His dad was – he definitely wasn't uh, a layman, right? He, But he took it way farther than was expected. So, Yeah. He still gets all the credit in the world, but he didn't exactly start from nothing, you know? Yeah. And but you got to have money to make money, you know? It helps to just... Yeah. If, you, if you're born with a million bucks, I mean, it's a great way to start. I mean, you could lose it all or you can become a billionaire, but it's certainly easier to become a billionaire when you start with a million dollars than to become a billionaire if you start with $10, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing about individualism is that it there's personal responsibility involved also. Yeah. Like a lot of it, like you have to, it's, it's up to you, you know, like you can't just be part of some kind of collective that does great things. Yeah. Like nobody's going to respect you for that. You have to, you know, like you said, you can, if you start the, uh, it, it might be easier to become great if you start as the son of somebody great, but you still have to do it yourself. Yeah. And you're responsible for your own success or failure. Yeah. So uh, what do you think are like some more good things about honor culture? And we don't have to necessarily go back that far, you know what I mean? But uh, you don't have to, you don't have to go that far that far even, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred years, a hundred, fifty years maybe. Um, yeah. To get to what was a lot closer to an honor culture and, you know, hell, even a hundred years is still much different than today. Um, like, I'll start. I think that um, I, 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 I don't know who said this. Um, I'm paraphrasing. You know, and it's a very simple little quote. Basically that, like, soft times make soft men. You know what I mean? Um, and this idea that the more civilized we get and the more, um, like the less war, the less chaos, the more uh, 
peace and all that. And it's all good stuff, but that it, that soft times make soft men. You know, you think of like a, an Amer- the average American today compared to like a Spartan. You know what I mean? And just mm-hmm. how hard they were and how soft we are, you know, mentally. Um, and I think even we look back at the generation before and the generation before them and we see such huge differences. But I mean, imagine a thousand years ago, you know, a couple thousand years ago and how much harder those people were. And so it's like, obviously I'm not advocating for barbarism or um, incivility or being uncivilized. Right. But it's like, it's a problem we need to address though. You know what I mean? We, without conflict, without struggle, people we're making a whole generation now. And it's, and, and, you know, I say it's not that quick, right? We could say the same thing about the last few hundred years, maybe, uh, but just more and more every generation, but we're making a generation of weak individuals. Right. And uh, it's another quote or another thing I'm paraphrasing, but somebody saying that, you know, it's a sign of that your, of your society's like demise or diminishing when people are more, people spend more time and energy thinking about recipes to make food taste better than like anything else. You know what I mean? Like the fact that we have people who make livings out of making tasty sauces, you know, it's like that life is too easy, you know, that men are weak, you know, like generally speaking, obviously individuals aren't, you know, there's strong men here and there and, uh, you know, hard, uh, thoughtful, you know, uh, people, but, Like, and it's like, we're totally there, you know, any sort of cautionary tale from the past about, you know, I mean, think of like Rome, like before it fell and all that stuff. It's like, we're there, man. It's like, um, so it's like, I don't think we need war. We just need to address the problem. You know what I mean? We need to, we haven't figured out yet as a species, how to keep a society, um, from like tearing itself apart you know, and dividing into tribalism and caring about dumb things when there's not a real conflict, you know, if there's not a genuine struggle for the people to care about, we need to find a way to still harbor all the things that make people better, like struggle, you know, and so you think like sports is a good way to do that, right? You think of like, if you play, if you're playing football and you you go through things, you go through adversity you know, you're, you feel camaraderie with your, with your fellow players and, and you fail and you, and when you lose, you feel sad. And it's like everything, these are all formative moments. You know what I mean? And it used to be that was war that did that. You know, everybody, every man went to war basically war was always happening and every able-bodied man would go do it. Um, and there weren't a lot of, I mean, there were sports, but it wasn't as big of a deal now. I mean, I mean, I mean, then they made like gladiators. They turn that into a sport. But it's like, I don't know if we just need more people to play sports. If there needs to be like adult sports, you know, there aren't really. If you're not a professional and you don't play sports anymore, you know what I mean? But like, so those those men and women that play sports as adults that are professionals, like they still get to do that. They still get to strive for greatness and win glory and and work hard at a common goal and be part of something bigger than themselves. These are all things that all of us search for, you know, Mm -hmm. but unless you're like in war or in a professional sports team, then as an adult, you have like nothing, you know? So what do people do? They go on Twitter, they find a mob to go get it, to be a part of, to be pissed about. It's like, everybody wants that purpose. And, And I think that comes from the soft time that we're in, you know, and, and, and it's a good thing. We want to care about sauce and, and not about, you know, dying so much. But it's like we need to find a way to address that problem. And it's a way, I think we need to find a like a we need to invent like an honor culture, you know, that's like artificial, you know, just like sports. We need something like that for the layman, for the normal adult who hmm. can't who isn't athletic enough to play professional sports. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Well, actually, another like this kind of goes along with another thing that I think is good about honor culture, which is reputation, like focus on reputation. 
Yeah. Um, like for the for the characters in the Iliad, um, you know, honor is a very public thing. It's a thing you have to outwardly demonstrate to people, and yeah. it's it's determined almost entirely by other people's opinion of you. Yeah. Like your reputation with other people. And, you know, I think the way that I think about this cuts against the common, uh, the common wisdom of today, which is that you shouldn't care what other people think about you. Yeah. I've you should be. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like, maybe we need a little more of that. Like, yeah. Maybe the way other people think about you matters because it tells you something about yourself. Like maybe yeah. if everyone around you thinks you're stupid, maybe you're stupid, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I get the idea of like, it shouldn't be everything, but you, I mean, you hear that co in the context of that is usually, you know, be yourself, you know, just be fucking weird or whatever. You know, if there's something weird, then who cares what other people think? Just be weird anyway. And I think the time and place for not caring what people think is basically when everyone else is wrong and you're right. And by that, it's not like, and I mean that in like a moral way, you know what I mean? Like then it's right to stand up against everybody else when they're wrong. Right. But if it's social norms, if it's, you know, expectations, then they're not wrong. You're just, you know, weird. <laughs> okay. If, if, if you're in a group that thinks, you know, if you're if you're if you're in a combat unit who thinks we should totally kill all the women and children and you're the one guy who doesn't. Yeah, you shouldn't care what everyone else thinks. You should do what's right. But if you are a man and you want to, I don't know, uh, get your nails painted. Right. Just because you think it's cool. You know. Yeah, I think. I think the rest of us who judge you for having for painting your nails or whatever have every right to judge you, right? To think what a freaking idiot. Like what that's you know, uh it's weak sauce. And he, like the shame is an important factor in keeping people like I don't know, on the most virtuous path. You know what I mean? Like we keep I don't know. Nails was a bad example. I mean, in my in my head, I was thinking of straight males. <laughs> you know, like like if I just painted my nails and went to work tomorrow. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to be like I'm not trying to be a woman. I'm not whatever. I just I like the color green. So I just I think it'd be cool to have green nails. You know, like for someone to be like, yeah, who don't, it doesn't matter what everyone else thinks. You shouldn't care what other people think. It's like, no, what other people think keeps me from doing a lot of stupid crap, like painting my nails green. I mean, I don't want to, but that's a weird example, but you know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of crap that we don't do, you know, and there's all kinds of, we better ourselves in a lot of ways to try and keep up with what people expect of us or to try and not be looked down on. And if it makes us better people, you know, if you just don't care and you just lay around in your own filth all day and you're just nasty and stinky and you like you don't care what people think about how you smell, you know, you don't care what people think about how you look or how you talk, you know, if you're out, if you're out in public just swearing and cursing and and you know, saying really foul stuff in front of little kids, it's like I don't care what people think. It's like the way other people think of you is the entire basis for things like that, for why you don't go talk about sex and gross things in front of little kids like why is that that's a social norm that it's completely based on reputation on expectations you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and a society where we abide by that weird ass idea that oh you should just not care what people think there would be no such thing as a social norm anymore you'd have no reason to be mad at somebody for you know saying filthy things in front of your kid you know what i mean you have no reason if there's naked people walking around, you know, at the park when you're taking your kid to the swings, you know, what, what moral like legs do you have to stand on? If we actually abided by this, you know, who cares what other people think thing? Yeah. And that's what other people think is what drives almost all human decency, you know? Right. So I, and the thing is, I kind of think people who do things like that, like purposefully do things outside the social norms, I don't think they're really doing it because they don't care what other people think. 
Yeah. Like I think there are subcultures that actually promote that. Like mm -hmm. the norm for those subcultures is to buck the typical social norms. Yeah. They want people so to like, think they don't care what people think. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like yeah. they want they want the people in the subculture to think they're cool. So and and the cool thing to do is to buck the trends of of the rest of the culture. Right. So it's like they're still ab they're still abiding by like they're still using that as a guiding principle, like reputation among their peers. It's yeah. just that their peers are somebody else. Yeah. And what people don't realize is that is honor. You know? yeah. And that there's little sub honor cultures and a little a different honor code will will make very different behavior, you know, than than another honor code, you know. But the common denominator is caring what your peers think of you and what people or what your su superior subordinates think of you. Right. Um, I hate this idea. And you and I have spoken about this. I hate what we've turned honor into, like almost even in the military, nine times out of 10, when we talk about honor, we're talking about lying. That's like, or, or maybe lying, cheating and stealing, but really lying like nine times. Out Dishonesty. Of 10. Yeah. That yeah. honesty and honor are synonymous now. Now, they are certainly related in an honor code in which we value honesty that I buy. You know what I mean? And I mm -hmm. value honesty and I think it's a dishonorable thing in our honor code to be dishonest, but there's much more to it. And honor itself is not honesty. And like this honor equals integrity thing and integrity equals honesty. <laughs> it's like, that's what it's turned into. And what's funny is the closest thing to real honor is in the military, but even in the military, we talk about it the wrong way most of the time. You think about, and, and the best example is the Medal of Honor. It's not called the Medal of Honesty. You don't get a freaking Medal of Honor for telling the truth all the time. You get a Medal of Honor for being a hero, for doing something courageous, amazing. It's called the Medal of Honor because it's supposed to honor you. It is a reward. It is a Look at this guy, everyone. You're putting a person on a pedestal as it's all about reputation. You want everyone to know it. You, you know, it's all medals are like that. All honors are like that. We call them honors and decorations, right? Like, because you are honoring someone. It's an outward, it, it's an outward representation of something great that you've done, which yes. is, that's what, you know, that's what Briseis is in the Iliad. Right. So it's basically honor is like almost like this currency and you earn it by being great by doing great things whatever that may be you know depending on your on your little culture and on your on your code that you live by and that can be different for different groups there can even be like subgroups within bigger groups you know like think about honor in baseball you know what i mean like there's a different honor code in baseball you know that doesn't mean they're also americans who live in our society and have a different another honor code to live by you know what I mean? But the same thing applies, you know, so honor is such a general term, but you, it's currency that you earn by being great. You know, you could be, you earn honor in the sciences by discovering something or disproving something. A Nobel prize is an honor. You know what I mean? Like things like that. It's people think of honor the wrong way, but what I think of honor I think of honor at its core, like if I if there was one phrase to sum it up, it is the is the lack of shame. Sorry, sorry, dishonor. It's the opposite of shame. My bad. Honor is like the opposite of shame, right? Mm -hmm. And people who don't give a shit about shame don't give a shit about honor. You know what I mean? You have to care about both, right? Um, if you don't care about shame, then you really don't care about the opposite of it. You know. Um, so I think we need shame and I hate this, this culture that, that we're living in that hates shame. You know what I mean? That says there is no such thing as normal. There is no such thing as like appropriate behavior or the way that or, or we shouldn't have any expectations at all of anybody. You know what I mean? Um, there's no lines, <laughs> you know? Um, and the way I see it is there just, there has to be standards, you know, whether it be moral behavior, whether it be um, like how you handle adversity, whether it be like manhood, 
you know, things like that. Like there's a, there's a right way to be and there's a wrong way to be. And, and you should be ashamed of yourself if you don't, you know, like if you're a man and you, I don't know, and you get a lady pregnant and you have kids and then you abandon your kids, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know what I mean? That's not mm-hmm. honorable. You have no honor because you're not a man, right? That's not manly, you know, and that's all based on an expectation. You know what I mean? And a society that doesn't have that expectation, that has no expectations, that where there is no such thing as shame, how do what leg do we have to stand on to tell a man, hey, you should be there. You should go be a dad for your kids. You should not leave, you know, abandon them. What leg do we have to stand on in a society where there's no such thing as normal, where there's no such thing as standards? You know what I mean? Yeah. And like in a, I think in a functional culture like this, like a, a culture with functional standards. Yeah. Uh, I think the cultural norms and the the honor versus shame, I think what that does is it's a shortcut to uh, it's a shortcut to telling everyone what good moral behavior is. Yeah. Cuz like if if it was uh you know if it was like we're like you're saying we just don't have any standards, don't have any cultural norms at all. Um, then the only way to, to reinforce, uh, then the only way to get elicit, to to elicit correct moral behavior would be to convince everyone to do the moral thing. Right. And sometimes it's necessary when your cultural norms are wrong, right? Right. Sometimes it's necessary, but it's way more efficient to just have cultural norms that reinforce the moral behavior. Yes. Yeah. And I think and then, I think that's the function of of honor and shame in a yeah. functional culture. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And then you know, it's still fun to talk about why certain things are the right behavior and some are wrong and some are shameful and some are honorable and that's a fun exercise, but yeah, as a shortcut we can just teach kids a certain thing and if most of them buy onto it when they're adults that's going to be the norm, you know what I mean? Um so yeah, I'm with you. And, and yeah, that doesn't mean I think all of our social norms are correct, you know, and that they shouldn't be challenged ever. Obviously, there's been plenty of examples of horrible social norms, right? Like s- racism and segregation and slavery and things like that, right? All kinds of examples where, thankfully, somebody stood up against everybody else, you know, and started spreading their message until it was big enough that the norm changed. You know? Yeah. And that's like you're, like you're saying um, with the example of if you're in the military and everyone else wants to kill all the women and children, like that's the appropriate time to to stand up and say, no, this is immoral. We should not do this. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I mean, I think of, I think of that as an honorable thing, but certainly within his little subculture where, where all of them bought that except for him, he would be dishonored among them, but it takes us, it takes some other group who does have some moral standard of not killing women and children for him to be honored, you know, and that does exist in generally in society, right? We think that way, but there's a reason why, you know, a thousand years ago in every battle, every city that was sacked, the women were all raped and the men were all killed, you know, and that was the norm. And there just weren't people that stood up against it. And even if they did, there would be no other culture outside of the military that would like be on their side and honor them for that. So, you know, so um, honor isn't based on universal moral truth. It is based on the best moral answer that we have as a group, you know what I mean? So honor is different now than it was a thousand years ago. Like the code is different now, you know what I mean? Because honor code is like the behaviors that if you abide by will earn you honor, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That if you, you know, don't follow will earn you shame, right? That's an honor code. And so the code has changed, but the method is the same. Like the way it works is shame and honor. So I think people should think more about it. People should think more about honor and shame. It should be more in the front of people's minds. Um, 
I think. Yeah, and yeah. and it's not that it's not that you should never challenge social norms again, but I think the key idea is that honor and shame impose a cost, a social cost on challenging social norms. Yeah. It's and it's something that needs to be there so we don't cha- we don't just willy-nilly challenge social norms. Right. Um or it's even worse is people but, who aren't taking a stance against social norms, but they just don't care. Like they just do whatever they want and they don't care. It's not even that they're actively taking a stance against what they see as wrong. Like just men who like a good example would be like a man who, you know, leaves his children, you know, abandons them and never is there for them. I don't think he's trying to I don't think he even thinks he's doing the right thing. There's just not a shame culture, like an honor culture to enforce, to make him feel that shame. You know what I mean? He can mm. just live with it. It's, so that's even worse. It's, 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 it's one thing to take a stand you know, against something that you think everyone's got wrong. But what's worse is when people just don't have to care about right. doing the right thing because there's no enforcement. There's no you know, reinforcing principle. They don't feel the sh- you know the disdain of everyone around them. Uh, you know, they don't feel the shame for doing wrong or the honor for doing good. <clears throat> right. So, so the the honor and shame imposes a social cost on on either standing up against social norms or just not caring about them right. at all. And exactly. what it eliminates it, it eliminates people not caring about it at all. Right. And then it says. If you really believe that this social norm is wrong and needs to be changed, you can stand up against it, but there's going to be a social cost that you need to be aware of. Yeah. And if you're if you're okay with if you're okay with accepting that cost and you really think you're right and you think it's worth it and this matters and you know you it's important enough for you to take on that cost and accept it then do it. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's, I think that sums up what was good about honor culture and what we're missing today. And I think, you know, it came up when I spoke with Colin Moriarty that first time and we spoke a good little bit about honor and he, you know, he told me about the, the carpet cleaner guy who showed up and just out of the blue, like told him that he dodged the draft Vietnam by going to, uh, Canada or whatever, or Mexico. Yeah, I went to Mexico during Vietnam to to avoid the draft and how he just lost a ton of respect for this guy he didn't even know. And it was like, you know, it really is that it epitomizes the problem with our culture. Like the fact that he's comfortable enough telling a complete stranger that story just shows how little people care about honor. Oh my God, do you hear squeaking? Horrible timing. No, oh, damn it! I don't, I don't a, hear it. Dog has a squeak toy. I'm certain it'll come up. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> I'm leaving that in there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. Anyway, um, real professional. <laughs> um, God, what was I even saying? Oh yeah, you're so, you're summing yeah, up yeah. our our honor culture conversation, right. and it's like that is, you know. Like people think of honor as archaic, you know, and it's obviously there. Like we said, right. There's so many examples of where you feel it in your gut and we just don't call it honor and we don't, it's not a thought, it's a feeling, you know what I mean? And we don't call it honor anymore, but, but the, but it is something we should think about, talk about and care about, you know, and, you know, you should not feel comfortable telling people that you're a coward. You know what I mean? You should not feel comfortable telling people that you went to Mexico to dodge the draft in Vietnam, you know, as much as I think the draft is a bad thing. And I think Vietnam was a dumb war, you know, keep that, just keep that to yourself. You know what I mean? Like that's that uh, telling a stranger that too, like you're not, it's not even a friend, not even someone you're comfortable with. I mean, you tell your friends and people you're comfortable with things that you wouldn't tell other people, maybe even things you would be ashamed to tell other people. Yeah, there is still some shame, you know, there's still some honor, but that is just that that's it's not surprising because, of course, that's what we do. And and, but so it's not surprising, but it's 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 indicative of the culture that we now live in where honor is dead, you know. 
Yeah. So. Well, um, that was good stuff about honor. Yeah. Um, that was a great way to end the show. That was good stuff about honor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In conclusion, well, that was good stuff. That's it for the honor part of our conversation on the Iliad. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you'll tune into part two for a discussion on fate, destiny, and the gods. Thanks for listening. If you like this show, there are many ways you can support it. You can talk about it on your own blog or podcast, you can share it on social media with your friends, or you can leave a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you happen to listen to it. If you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to the channel and hit the thumbs up button if you like this video. Thank you for your support, and we'll see you next time on Philosophication.